our second Holly Bush Institute talk of the semester. Um, the first one was on the Ebola crisis in West Africa. This is our second um, Chilean apple pie, the international production of U.S. food by our Holly Bush fellow, Captain Turner. Dr. Turner is a PhD graduate from the University of Delaware in history. She's here for the year. She's teaching a couple of classes, and she's also doing some research on various topics. And here is one of the topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, today's talk is, is of particular interest, not only because it tells you a little bit about the international origins of food, or the domestic origins of food, but it can help us think about the U.S.'s role in the world today in the context of globalization pressures, in the context of capitalist pressures, to internationalize our economy. Um, we typically think about the U.S. as a provider of food, as a supplier of food, especially to developing countries, but in many cases that's not true. In many cases we are also a consumer on the international market. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Turner. Hello everyone, thanks for coming. I'm not here to make you feel bad about your food, so I'll try to do that as little as possible. Um, so I'm starting with this image of apple pie, this really uh, quintessential American dish. You'll probably have it at Thanksgiving, made with butter that was maybe produced in New York State, um, flour from wheat grown in Washington State, sugar from Florida, the top sugarcane state in the United States, and apples from Chile, maybe. As Thanksgiving approaches, we're all thinking a lot about food. Eating imported food, knowing that our apples come from Chile, pushes our buttons, I think, in complicated ways. For Americans, food is tied up with feelings of pride and national identity. We're known internationally, some might say infamous internationally, for our, you know, our most famous food exports are things like hamburgers and hot dogs and Coke, and most importantly, the idea of supersizing, right? More food. But Americans are sometimes surprised to realize how much food is being made outside of our borders, and it's a number that's growing every year. It's made sometimes very far outside of our borders, made by people and sent through supply chains in ways that might surprise us. But why should it bother us? The answer has to do with America's historical identity as a self-sufficient food exporter. Food abundance has equaled political power for most of American history. Uh, the issue has been brought to a head in recent years by um, various food safety crises in imported foods, but the underlying issues really go a lot deeper. So first I'll give a little bit of background. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. First I'll give a little background on America's history with food imports and exports. Um, and just a note here that in this talk I'm using America to mean the United States of America, even though it really should properly refer to, you know, the continent, but I'm using the common usage. Uh, historian Karen Ordahl Kupperman wrote that America was international before it was national. Europeans settled in the New World in a global context, expanding existing trade networks that connected North America with Central and South America, with Africa, with Europe, and Asia. The North American colonies really were intended as stops on a commercial circumnavigation of the globe, sending fish and lumber and tobacco to Europe, receiving slaves and sugar from the Caribbean, converting sugar to rum for export all around the world, sending fur and ginseng across the Pacific for tea, ceramics, and fabric from China. This is um, one of the most important early American food imports, which is sugar, um, specifically loaf sugar. Sugar was shipped around the world in these sort of hardened cones. It was rock hard, and to use it, you had to either scrape it as this lady is doing, um, or you know, break it apart or pound it if you needed it in granulated form for your recipes. So sugar was a lot of work for the consumer, but of course it was created by slave labor in the Caribbean. We tend to idealize American colonial and frontier settlers as really self-sufficient, that they're hunting and farming and surviving on America's natural bounty. In fact, even the poorest colonists had occasional access to food and food-related items from around the world, uh, most often tea from China and India, um, and the sugar from the Caribbean, but also they were getting coffee and nutmeg and cinnamon from Southeast Asia. They were using teacups from China. They were getting confections, you know, candy from France, um, prepared condiments, mustard, ketchup, and even bottled beer from England. And in fact, American colonists had tremendous difficulty giving up the tea for political reasons during the whole Tea Party 
Uh, they tried to content themselves with various herbal teas, but more often colonists had to um, police their neighbors who were always trying to sneak tea. So not only do we import food, we're kind of addicted to the imports. So America's food really was global to begin with. But the colonial period also saw the beginnings of the US's long history of exporting food. The colonies were a rich source of commodities to export to Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. In addition to the best known cash crops like tobacco and cotton, the colonies also raised and exported food crops, wheat, corn, rice, dried and salted fish, packed meat, butter and cheese, rum and whiskey. Uh, the middle colonies, including New Jersey, were known as the bread basket or the bread colonies for the great amounts of wheat and rye and corn and oats that they produced. One of the lesser known American food exports was ginseng. American colonies harvested and sent vast quantities of ginseng root to Asia, and most of it was shipped out of Philadelphia, um, where it was used as a medicine and a general sort of herbal tonic. In fact, when American ginseng reached China, the Chinese market in the 1730s, it destroyed the long-established Korean trade in ginseng. So Korea's you know, Chinese market for ginseng dropped out when American ginseng came in. Wild ginseng is still being harvested in the Appalachians, and it fetches quite high prices. So if you happen to know where any wild ginseng is, pick it up. If you would know what it looks like, which I really would not. So over the course of the 19th century, um, as the US, United States, new United States pushed westward through war and military expansion, through the fertile lands of the East and the Midwest, and finally into the, the vast dry expanses of the West, its food crop production expanded. By the early 19th century even, European visitors to the United States were impressed with the abundance, cheapness, and variety of its food, although they often commented on the wastefulness and carelessness of its citizens. Americans were often stereotyped as people who had more food than sense, and the fact that pigs were so important in early American food led a lot of European visitors to make kind of snotty comments about how Americans were just like hogs, that they ate a lot and grew fast and, and so on. But American food technology was really transformed by the industrialization of agriculture. Agriculture was transformed just like factory production was. This was involved new technologies like uh, mechanical reapers and harvesters like this, um, steel plows. New imports like commercial seeds and fertilizer gave more uh, reliable crops. And finally, a transportation revolution that encouraged large-scale commercial agriculture. So if you lived henceforth out in the middle of nowhere and suddenly the railroad came through your town, now you had access to markets. Now you could raise a cash crop of wheat or corn or oats and send it to market and become part of the market. America's food production soared and food prices fell over the course of the 19th century. In 1898, $1 could buy twice as much flour as in 1872. It could buy 42% more milk and 114% more sugar. American's obsession with sugar began at least 150 years ago. And every immigrant to the United States commented on how cheap meat was here. That in Europe they ate meat if maybe once a month if they were lucky, a few times a year. And in the United States, even the poorest people had meat once a week, once a day, three times a day. Railroads also shipped fresh fruits and vegetables all over the country. You know, shipping Georgia peaches to the Northeast or New Jersey tomatoes to Boston. Uh, refrigerated cars were bringing fresh produce from California to the East Coast before the end of the 19th century. This image is from 1876. So Americans at this time, if they were among the group of people who didn't really have to scrimp to make ends meet, they weren't the poorest Americans, viewed themselves as a people of plenty in a country capable of feeding all of its citizens, even as the citizenry was expanding through massive immigration. There were more and more people coming every year, and yet the US could still feed them all. At the time of the centennial celebration in 1876, and even more so by the Columbian Exposition in 1893, Americans revived the pilgrim idea of America as a city on the hill, particularly blessed by God and fruitful through divine providence. So they put sort of a religious spin on the idea that America could feed everyone who lived there. The abundance, of course, had been created through quite non-magical means like military expansion, new farm and transportation technology, increased economies of scale. But to the people at the time, it felt like magic. Americans began to believe that they could be the first people in history 
to finally eliminate hunger through science, technology, political will, and geographical advantage. Abundance was part of what made America exceptional. And native-born white Americans believed that their cuisine was superior too. Around 1900, again, as these new immigrants are streaming in, native-born Americans only gradually incorporated so-called foreign dishes. In fact, there was a strong counter-movement to establish traditional American food ways, specifically the food of New England. Um, boiled meats, wheat, cornmeal, fruit pies, not much in the way of exotic spices like garlic. Um, our traditional Thanksgiving dinner today is really um, based on the 19th century imagery of New England, not on what the colonists, the, um, you know, the first pilgrims actually ate, which was probably wild, wild game and you know, some oysters. The late 19th century also saw the rise of giant food processors who preserved the US food bounty in cans and packages. Canned meat, condensed milk, bottled soda, breakfast cereal. These new companies put brand names on their packages and invested heavily in advertising in order to generate demand for these essentially new products. They were preserved and portable so the products lent themselves to export. And the food companies quickly figured out the benefit of generating demand for Coca-Cola or Heinz baked beans or Borden's condensed milk overseas. In fact, the, the British took to um, Heinz baked beans to a great extent, and they still eat them for breakfast there traditionally. I don't know why breakfast. The US, United States' sense of its strength as a food producer definitely contributed to its movements into imperialism around the turn of the 20th century. American commercial presence overseas, bolstered by military strength when necessary, provided a market for American food at favorable terms. American food was imported all over the world, and Americans thought to themselves, if we can keep expanding our markets by selling more and more overseas, we can protect our own economy. We won't have industrial depressions. We will have high employment um, if we could just keep expanding that market. So by the turn of the 20th century, Americans saw themselves as benefiting from the fruits of empire. They got the best delicacies as they saw it from around the world. Americans who had the money could afford spices and treats from around the world. Um, French cheese, Chinese ginger and litchi nuts, Spanish olives, something they called alligator pears from the West Indies, which were avocados, which they recommended cooking. I'm like, yes, cook, bake them in the oven for half an hour. Recent immigrants from Italy imported enormous quantities of cheese, pasta, and olive oil. So by 1920, the US was importing $1.84 billion worth of food, like these bananas coming from Costa Rica circa 1900. Some imported foods that were already becoming staples were made possible by open exhibits of US military power, allied to American corporations. United Fruit is the best known example of American multinational corporations that dominated Caribbean and Central American country, companies, countries as huge landowners and as massive employers who paid their workers little and repressed any labor organization. By 1920, Americans imported $19 million worth of bananas. Americans also enjoyed sugar and pineapples from Hawaii, mostly unconcerned by the white military coup that had overthrown the native Hawaiian government in 1893 and opened the islands to US annexation. Another import, coffee, had become a cheap staple by then. $252 million worth of coffee was imported, mostly from Latin America. However, coffee was imported as a raw product and mostly processed in the United States. So most of the profit you know, was added in the United States. The value was added in the United States by the retailers, wholesalers, roasters, grinders, and packagers. The workers who cultivated the beans earned about a penny per pound of coffee for which an American consumer paid 25 cents. So Americans got to experience imported foods as exciting novelties or comforting staple foods, mostly unaware of their political and economic implications in the larger world. By the 1920s, foreign food seemed less threatening and native-born Americans were beginning to cautiously incorporate foreign foods into their menus. And I'm putting quotation marks around spaghetti here because this is, of course, canned spaghetti by Beech Nut. Um, mild, very, very mild curried cream sauce and Mexican tamales of various kinds. By 
but their acceptance was very hesitant and very qualified. Americans tended to accept foreign recipes only when the group in question was no longer seen as a threat. So for instance, Italian food became popular in the mainstream only after uh, immigration from Italy had been limited in the 1920s, um, or whether when the food in question was transferred through another colonial power. You know, when Americans ate creamed curried eggs, they're really eating a, a British dish rather than an Indian dish. Americans incorporated foods less from a sense of admiration than as a sort of slumming in which they could enjoy the food of people while still considering them somewhat superior, inferior. So tasting foreign dishes and importing foreign foods didn't really shake Americans' feelings of basic food superiority. The standard American recipe for spaghetti, by the way, in the 1910s and 20s was to boil it for at least 30 minutes. I don't even know how it was still like solid at that point. But you would boil it and then put the sauce on it and then bake it in the oven. Why not? In the 20th century, the US realized the military advantages of this country's great capacity to produce food. When the US entered World War I, it could offer plenty of food to donate or sell to war-torn allied countries. The US Food Administration asked Americans voluntarily to limit or conserve food during the war, like meat or wheat. There were meatless days and wheatless days and so on, in order to facilitate troop provisioning and divert more food, food more efficiently to the allies. Resulting in huge food surpluses after the war, American farmers produced so much, so much food during World War I that farm prices were seriously depressed during the 1920s as a result of overproduction. So even given a little bit of spurring, Americans could produce way too much food. World War I also highlighted the political advantages of being a global food exporter. The US had the power to help friends or punish enemies with its massive food supplies. After the war, the US even had enough surplus food to donate in large quantities to starving people in other countries. For example, President Hoover's Relief Administration sent $20 million worth of food to victims of the Russian famine in the early 1920s. So the abundance on which Americans had prided themselves had turned into real political capital. Food's power to help win the war was even more obvious during World War II. Again, as in World War I, the US had more than enough food to feed itself and its allies. Full-scale rationing was in place during World War II, mainly because of the logistical difficulties of getting food supplies to the military at a time when you know, the military was mostly overseas and shipping was heavily disrupted by, uh, by war. Um, but generally speaking, there was enough food. It was a matter of getting it where it was needed and smoothing out seasonal variations. So Americans had to limit their consumption of red meat and sugar and things like that during the war, but there were no shortages you know, near to the kind that, say, Great Britain faced during World War II. American soldiers were well known to be the best fed in the world, which served propaganda as well as functional purposes. Soldiers were allotted the equivalent of 360 pounds of meat a year at a time when the average American male ate 125 pounds a year. A midday meal for soldiers at an Air Force base in Texas in 1942, this wasn't a Thanksgiving meal, by the way, this was just a regular day, included celery, olives, lettuce, roast turkey, cranberry jam, mashed potatoes, raisin dressing, giblet gravy, buttered asparagus, cream cauliflower, lemon custard, ice cream, rolls and butter, layer cake, coffee and tea. To be American was to be associated with tremendous quantities of food, even in the midst of a global war. The United States' place in the post-war world was cemented in part by its massive food resources. The Berlin Airlift, in which US and other allied planes brought tons of food and supplies daily for Berliners trapped by Soviet blockade, demonstrated that food would be an important tool for gaining political support as the Cold War hardened. The Food for Peace program, begun in 1954, used American surplus food, um, initially bought by the government um, as part of subsidy programs going back to the 1930s and later bought from farmers at competitive rates. Used American surplus food strategically by giving food aid to third world nations. And the strategic part of it was, was clarified by President Kennedy when he said in 1961, food is strength and food is peace and food is freedom and food is a helping to people around the world whose goodwill and friendship we want. <laughs> 
the U.S. could win friends and defeat enemies with its food surpluses. This food aid, um, Americans sharing their abundance, has been a contested legacy. Food aid has saved millions from starvation and malnutrition, especially the children and elderly who are most at risk. But food aid can also have long-term bad effects on a nation's economy. The cheap food helps support low wages in those countries because people can live on very little money if their food is artificially cheap or free. It reduced those countries' ability to be self-sufficient in food because farmers can't compete with free or cheap food. And this food is extra cheap because it's coming from highly subsidized, highly mechanized American farms. So those farmers were encouraged to move into low-wage industries, to move out of farming, i.e. making goods for export, or switching to higher technology green revolution monoculture. The green revolution was an international technology transfer program from the 40s to the 1960s, which was intended to transfer the techniques and the benefits of scientific American style farming to the rest of the world. Farmers were given high yield seed varieties. They were taught to use modern inputs like fertilizer, uh, motorized farm equipment, and encouraged to move toward large scale monoculture. Monoculture meaning you, know, you raise an awful lot of exactly the same thing. Agricultural outputs increased greatly. The world's food supply did increase from the Green Revolution, but the new techniques also diminished local crop diversity and increased farmers' dependence on petroleum production and ag companies. Now they have to, have, they have to purchase the fertilizer and the seed and the tractors. Ironically, some countries that were food self-sufficient immediately after World War II were no longer self-sufficient after receiving aid. So it's been problematic when Americans have tried to transfer their food abundance elsewhere. It's not a simple matter. Global food shortages in the 1970s forced nations which are no longer food self-sufficient to borrow money from Western banks to feed their people. So those countries then had to repay their debt. Uh, the Bretton Woods Institute, which is sought to regulate the international monetary system, encourages debtor nations to focus on exports, including high value ones like food. If you can process a food product, you're adding a lot of value to it. So you're generating, generating a lot of income for a relatively small amount of work. Um, and encouraging those countries to use their abundant low wage labor to do this work. So either raising crops that require a lot of work or doing hand food processing. So many um, countries that were seeking to reduce their debt are looking for exports like process, producing high, um, I'm sorry, producing vegetables or processing food or similar. In another instance, um, China is not a debtor nation, but China is a country that has been jumped into especially food processing and production and offering super low prices on the components of processed food to, to move toward economic growth. So there are more countries looking to offer food as an export for their own purposes. At the same time that all this is going on, multinational food corporations, which are some of the largest companies in the world, started pushing for free trade food policies in the 1970s, 80s. This would free them up to relocate production to wherever wages were lowest, usually outside of the United States because of the United States' long history of labor organization and worker protection. And finally, the revolution in container shipping and cold supply chains made it feasible to produce fresh food far from where it will actually finally be consumed. So all these factors have come together in recent years. Global economic changes after World War II. Countries overseas looking for high value exports. Multinational food corporations looking for low wage workers mean that the U.S. is importing an ever increasing portion of its food supply. The U.S. still produces almost all of its own staples like wheat, uh, soybeans, dairy. We produce all the high fructose corn syrup in the world, you'll be glad to know. But seafood, uh, seafood, produce, processed food, and food additives are increasingly being manufactured or grown elsewhere. Between 1999 and 2007, imports of food rose by 50%, and they have certainly only increased since 2007. This is really a big shift historically. This is comparable to the period around 1900, when Americans began consuming large amounts of imported food, the sugar and bananas and coffee. This is where standing at the beginning of another major turn toward eating a lot of imported food. So where does our food come from today? 
According to the FDA, 80 to 90% of our seafood and 20% of the produce eaten in America is imported. The seafood is coming mainly from aquaculture in China, in Asia rather. China alone produces 70% of the farmed fish in the world. Fish farming is looking like the only way to produce, to meet increasing global demand for seafood when wild stocks are declining. There just aren't as many wild fish in the oceans, which is a whole other really sad story. Um, Atlantic salmon was first farmed in Norway in the 1970s, followed by Scotland, Ireland, Canada, Chile, and other kinds of seafood are being farmed um, as well. As with other intensive forms of livestock farming, farmers often turn, illegally in the US, to excessive use of antibiotics to counter disease caused by overcrowding. There's environmental issues like waste concentration. Essentially, you have a lot of fish you know, swimming in an open pen in, in the water, it's like an aquarium, they poop a lot, and the poop has to go somewhere. And the use of wild fish to feed farm fish. So wild fish are caught in order to feed farm fish. Our concerns, even in regulated US fish farming, fish farming is much less regulated overseas. Uh, this is an image of shrimp farming in the Sea of Cortez um, uh, in Mexico, in a place where there have been some recent issues with die-off and disease that the shrimp are dying and there is no particular solution except to drug them a lot more, which is its own set of problems. Uh, shrimp farmed in the Fuching area in China has been frequently flagged for contamination with illegal veterinary drugs, pesticides, and agricultural pollutants. And shrimp farms elsewhere have suffered with massive mortality. And of course the, um, uh, the US is still kind of recovering from the effects of Katrina and the BP oil spill, which has diminished US shrimp production. Another major import, and kind of a surprising one, is fruits and vegetables, particularly organic and specialty vegetables. Guatemala is a major producer of broccoli for the United States. Broccoli is a product that requires care. You have to, to, to grow really perfect heads of broccoli, you have to have the right you know, um, weather conditions, but you also have to take some care um, in harvesting and, and maintaining the crop. And this is a place where people in Guatemala are willing to do this work for export. It's a, it's a valuable export crop for them. Interestingly, people in most of the broccoli growing areas in Guatemala do not eat broccoli. They consider it disgusting and are sort of confused by why they're growing such huge quantities of this food that nobody wants to eat. Uh, tiny baby vegetables. Back in the uh, 1980s, there was a trend for you know baby vegetables of everything. Those are often grown overseas, again, because of the great labor requirements. You really have to baby them if you will. Green beans, uh, especially Arago Vert, those very, very skinny French green beans, are grown extensively for the European market in West Africa, um, in Burkina Faso and in Kenya. Again, the beans require constant and careful care in order to reach the market flawless, and farm labor is cheaper in West Africa than it is anywhere in Europe. So the production has gone where the labor is cheapest, helped by transportation that allows fresh beans to be flown from Africa, flown from Guatemala, flown from elsewhere um, to the United States. As Americans increasingly seek out organic produce, the produce is being grown elsewhere, in Mexico, in Chile, Argentina, Turkey, and even in China. Current demand for organic produce in the United States exceeds the US supply. So more people want to buy organic. And organic, American organic produce is priced higher than conventional produce for obvious reasons. It takes more labor. Um, it is less productive to grow things organically than to rely on heavy chemicals. But low price chains like Walmart have committed in recent years to selling organics, so they're looking for the cheapest possible source of organics. Walmart is meeting its commitment to providing organic food by importing them from China. China is actually the world's third largest producer of organic food. But it's hard to certify that the food being produced is actually being produced in organic conditions. Um, the, in, in, essentially, it's up to the importers to go to the source and certify that their food is actually organic because the labels don't mean much in themselves. A big labeling issue is the country of origin laws for meat. Despite the US's longstanding image as um, a nation of cattle, of cattle raisers, 17 million heads of cattle annually are imported from Mexico, Australia, Canada, and Uruguay. Meat imports are a really controversial issue. 
since 2002, uh, fresh meat must be labeled with its country of origin. The law was expanded in 2008 to include fruits and vegetables and nuts and some other foods. This doesn't apply, apply to food processed in the United States with, other, with ingredients from other countries. For example, imported fish, which is processed in the United States into fish sticks, does not have to be labeled as an imported food. The Department of Agriculture recently announced that it will allow fully cooked, frozen, and refrigerated chicken processed in China to be sold in the United States. This law would theoretically allow US firms to ship raw chicken to China to be processed and ship back again to be sold. Although no American poultry firms currently do this, as of industry reports as of this month, the same mechanism is already at work in seafood. Salmon caught in Alaska is shipped to China for deboning and filleting and shipped back to be sold in the United States. Chinese labor is simply much cheaper for this very delicate work. Arguments around the country of origin laws revolve around the consumer response to imported food. Will Americans reject food if it comes from overseas? Uh, the, the meat lobby is, you know, the, the meat industry is a very powerful one in this country and they have very much argued for meat labeling because they think that will hurt imports, that if people see that this meat comes from Uruguay, they will not want to buy it. To me, it's an interesting question because it, it touches on that very issue. Why are Americans uncomfortable with imported food? Finally, some of the most imported, some of the most um, common imported food ingredients are the least visible, food additives and components of processed food. Vitamin supplements, dough conditioners, and other additives are produced around the world. So in case you can't see this, this top is a Nutrigrain bar. The US produces the high fructose corn syrup, the sugar, uh, the flour, the whole grain oats, the sunflower oil, the strawberry puree, the cellulose, and the red dye 40. China produces the vitamin and mineral supplements, and the honey, the carrageenan, which is a thickener, comes from the Philippines, the guar gum, another thickener from India, citric acid from Europe, lecithin from, so from Denmark, various things. And those are the, the least visible kinds of things. These generally aren't visible to consumers where these things are coming from. Invisible imported ingredients, of course, were the heart of the pet food scandal of 2007, which scared a lot of people about imported food. Hundreds of American pet food brands were contaminated with melamine, which is not a food substance. It's a, it's a form of plastic. Chinese manufacturers had sold low-priced wheat gluten and rice protein to be used in pet food manufacture in the United States. It turns out that those um, glutens were adulterated with melamine to make them look as though they had more protein in them when tested. And of course, it was not good for the animals who ate it because it built up in the, um, in the kidneys, I believe, and, and causes kidney failure. The scandal spurred a, an awareness among Americans that their food is coming from overseas and that it might not be what it seems. And I think what was particularly frightening to people about the pet food scandal was that it was in hundreds of products that all these different manufacturers of US pet food were essentially getting their stuff from the same place. Sometimes it was even the same pet food sold under different brand names. And it's also one contaminated ingredient contaminated quite a lot of food. The FDA and the Department of Agriculture theoretically inspect foreign plants that produce for the US market. And they theoretically inspect food coming into the country. Um, however, lack of staff due to budget cuts, the FDA is incredibly understaffed, means that in practice the FDA inspects less than 1% of food that comes into the country. Um, the FDA itself says the FDA is not required to inspect foreign firms that export food or feed products to the United States. We do conduct foreign food inspections in a number of targeted program areas, but these inspections are not a prerequisite for firms to export to the United States. The agency uses its limited inspection resources to look at products that pose the greatest risk to public health. And of course, after 2007, Americans became a lot more keen on the idea of what's in my food, my imported food. According to one source, the food seized by the FDA in 2007, after the melamine scandal had broken, including, quote, dried apples coated with a cancer-causing chemical, frozen catfish filled with banned antibiotics, scallops coated with rotting bacteria, and mushrooms tainted with harsh pesticides. <laughs>
the U.S. government has been hesitant to regulate food companies. Um, in the case of imports, particularly from China, it's simply not a simple matter to inspect all imports. In the wake of reduced U.S. imports of Chinese food after the melamine scandals, China imposed or threatened to impose trade limits on various U.S. exports to China. So China threatened to play tit for tat. If you limit our, our imports, we'll limit yours. More generally, multinational food corporations are huge and they have a lot of political power. Um, sometimes at the cost of American workers and consumers. In fact, imported food isn't necessarily unsafe or dangerous, of course. It's unsafe and dangerous when it's made for the lowest possible price. The, the food additives, the wheat gluten and rice gluten that were put into the pet food were adulterated with melamine because the producers who made it in China were trying to get in the lowest possible bid. They were offering, we can offer you this wheat gluten at the lowest price and it still has the required amount of um, protein in it. So the fact that the companies were looking for the lowest bid meant that they left themselves open to fraud of this kind. Higher quality and better qu conditions of production are possible, but not always at the low prices that Americans demand. So imported food can be um, a real threat to food safety issues, but is it also a threat to American pride? One response, our response to imported foods might sometimes be due to a flash of xenophobia, a fear of strangers, this discomfort that a person of another country, another culture has prepared the food that we're eating, and a sneaking suspicion that food practices outside the US will not be as clean, as safe, as well regulated as inside the US, which is kind of ironic because our own food system, of course, is far from clean or safe or reliable. There have been many, many instances of American-made products contaminated, unsafe, grown under disgusting conditions. Like Americans in centuries gone by, we assume, we want to believe that our food is the best, that it's abundant, as well as safe, as well as cheap, as well as fresh, as well as delicious, and somehow superior to that of other nations. Or it might be a discomfort with the reality of multinational corporations that underlie the logic of overseas food production. Americans have traditionally been uncomfortable thinking too closely about the people who make their food. In 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, which was a socialist expose of working class life. And it included terrible working conditions among people who uh, in the meatpacking plants of Chicago, these workers who um, uh, injured themselves on the job, who worked very long hours in inhumane conditions, who were um, fired at a moment's notice, who were deprived of their pay, not permitted to organize. The work was a huge success, but most of the attention it got was because of the descriptions of the nauseating conditions under which meat was packed, that there were you know, rats running around on the meat and everything went into the sausage and the floor was disgusting and the cows were diseased. That's what caught public attention. The book helped spur the creation of the US Food and Drug Administration, but was much less successful at changing working conditions. As Sinclair later remarked, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident I hit it in the stomach. Realizing that Alaskan salmon is being shipped across the Pacific for processing and shipped back forces us to think about the workers. Are Chinese food processing workers really pay that much less than American workers? How are they treated? Um, and about the entire supply chain, about the petroleum cost of putting food into enormous refrigerated container ships and shipping it thousands of miles and bringing it back again. And the logic of modern capitalism that means that work will always be shipped out to the lowest bidder. American food workers are not always well paid or protected by our laws. For example, uh, poultry workers suffer repetitive injuries and infections from processing chicken at high speeds. So we wonder, what are those workers in China experiencing? Are we part of this system now that, feeds our, that pays our workers so very little all over the world? Or perhaps our discomfort stems from a dim awareness that this is a different turn in American history. The time of US world dominance, of course, is gone, and our claim to food abundance might be weakening. Americans can no longer blithely believe that they have the most and the best food in the world. It seems clear that increasing amounts of US food is going to be produced or processed overseas. But we can and should encourage importers and manufacturers to insist on healthy and safe working conditions for overseas workers, 
We can push politicians to give more funding to regulatory agencies like the FDA. And maybe we can even open our minds to truly enjoy food from around the world, not just enlist the rest of the world into producing American-style food. Thank you. <laughs>